my classes, of course, are art history classes, and sometimes, much to my students' content or discontent, the emphasis is on history mm. as much as it is on art. Just looking at an artwork without understanding its socio-cultural context can be very limiting. You understand only part of it, but you do not understand, obviously, its broad implications within the, the socio-cultural context. I very often encourage my students to think of what I call the five C's. Mm. And I have to tell you, one of our majors uh, who has gone on to graduate school wrote to me recently and she said, oh my gosh, my graduate teacher used a parallel version of the five C's and the five C's are intended to help them understand socio-cultural context but also arranging their notes. Mm -hmm. So the five C's refer to content, context, commission, these are part of the socio-cultural analysis, and then the last two of them refer to what we identify in art, in art history as formal or stylistic analysis, and those are composition and color. So for each one of the artworks, whether it's a painting, sculpture, or a building, or a textile for that matter, or a coin, whatever the artifact is, I literally cover these five C's. Mm. Of course, in some cases, we will not know who um, who commissioned the work of art. So there are limitations, but whenever we know, I always cover these five C's. And students find them very, very useful because, first of all, they know that they have to have those five C's in their notes. It helps them arrange their notes. It helps them recall these five C's uh, for testing purposes. And it becomes almost sort of a game. Work. For example, a work that all students, uh, anyone knows, every, actually, even if they've never taken art history, the Mona Lisa. Students know it. It's one of the most used and abused images in art history, right? It has been commodified, it has been commercialized, so students are very familiar with it. And they have some sort of preconceptions and, as what uh, the work is all about. So, um, we will talk about, obviously, its content, who is the figure represented, context, why is Mona Lisa portrayed in the way she is. Uh, in most cases, students will have a reading that talks about the gender limitations and gender expectations as applied to the portrayal of women in the Renaissance. Uh, they might have read Leon Leonardo da Vinci's prescriptions as to how women should be represented, so this is part of the context, and then who commissioned it, to bring a very simple example. And then, of course, we are going to analyze how the figure is depicted, what is the meaning of the portrayal, what is the meaning of the background that will be part of the compositional arrangement, the structure, if color is relevant, we are going to discuss that as well. So unless one knows what the expectations of the time were as to the portrayal of women, the work is poor in its ability to convey that. Artworks or our understanding, I should say, of an artwork or a building for that matter or a sculpture is limited unless we understand um, context. And um, that might be counter in some ways to the ways that students understand art because particularly in um, non-figurative, non-representational art, art that is, is abstract, very often we project our understanding of it, and this is absolutely fine. This is something that we practice in art history, but 
it is equally significant to understand the stimuli that brought about a particular artwork. It develops the kind of skills that are applicable outside of art history observation. I mean, observing what you see and trying to uh, analyze it, I think, is a built, uh, it's a skill building activity that you can transfer to other situations. And I mentioned earlier on the fact that now poli police departments and medical schools use art history as the means to develop observation skills mm -hmm. because obviously images convey uh, information that is not necessarily evident when we're just crossing in front of it for six seconds but rather when we concentrate and analyze it in multiple ways. You've obviously taken notes on it. It's just something that you have to go over again and again, you know. So when you look at an Impressionist painting, like if you look at a Monet, you have to think, why were they painting outside? Why were they taking trains and going to the countryside? Why were they doing that, you know? Um, why did they change their style from more traditional to this abstract form of art? It all revolves around um, the movement and what was happening. So, like with that, you look at, oh, with trains, they could go into the countryside and take smaller canvases and go and paint anything they wanted, instead of having to paint cities or make up ideas, which is what a lot of traditional artists did because they didn't have access to go out and paint nature. Um, so it's just that kind of stuff that you have to think about. And almost always, the professors go over that in class with every painting, um, every sculpture. They're, they say, this is why this happened. If you're learning about this period, they say up front, this is why they painted like this. This is why they sculpted like this. The teacher will always point out a couple um, main points about the sociocultural in Dr. Toronto's class. She usually give you a slide right at the front of the PowerPoint with the big um, sociocultural events on it. And then usually in the notes, we'll write down things like that. Those are some of the bullet points I have about why this piece was important in this stage. Like maybe it was the first one of this kind or maybe it illustrated some stance or something um, that was revolutionary in that time period, you know, connecting it to the historical sense. It may not necessarily come as easily to some people, but once you get a hang of it and being able to identify the socio-political aspects of art, it comes, it comes quicker.